the rate of extinction isn't declining. It always looks as though there haven't been many extinctions in the last few years or even the last few decades because it takes quite a long time to be sure that a species has gone extinct. Species that go extinct are already rare, they're often in remote places. It's very hard to be absolutely sure that not a single one is still alive. And until we're that sure, it doesn't get listed as extinct. So we have growing numbers of species that we think are probably extinct, but we're not sure. And when you consider those, as well as the ones we are sure about, then it's very clear that the rate is not declining. And what's even more clear is that a rapidly increasing number of species are threatened with extinction. More and more species are moving up the ladder to extinction, moving towards that cliff edge at the top. And so not only has the extinction rate not fallen, it's about to get very much higher unless we change our ways. In some parts of the world, nature has been in retreat for thousands of years. So around the Mediterranean, for instance, the UK where I live, these have been heavily modified landscapes for centuries, even millennia. But since 1970, the human population on Earth has more than doubled. And each of those people is consuming twice as much as people did in 1970. This is putting unprecedented strain on natural and managed ecosystems. So although in some parts of the world, you'll find a long history of human um, interference and impact across much of the world, this is a new phenomenon or relatively new. There certainly hasn't been anything like this large scale, almost industrial change to the landscape and seascape. It isn't true that as few as 900 species have gone extinct since 1500. The truth is we don't really know exactly how many, but we do know that 900 is a woeful underestimate. And that's because it's very hard to get listed as extinct. First of all, you have to be named. Most species haven't even been named yet. And then people have to notice that they haven't found you again. And they have to survey all the places you might be and find you're not there anymore. That takes a huge amount of work and a long time. So most of those 900 are vertebrates. Um, and it's about one and a half, two percent of the species within those taxonomic groups. So it's not an absolutely vast number that have gone extinct already, but it is a lot more than 900. Two percent sounds like it's a number we might be able to live with. But the trouble is that human impacts across the planet are now so widespread and so severe that we're taking away the last refuges of more and more species. And so we have an ever growing number of species that are threatened with extinction because of their loss of their habitats, because of our exploitation of natural organisms, because of climate change increasingly, which is a threat that's only recently become important, because of pollution, and because of invasive species. So it's no exaggeration to say that a million species are threatened with extinction and that many of them will go extinct within decades unless we change the trajectory that we're on. Fortunately, there are loads of ways we can do that. What this report does is first of all, point out the urgency of making such changes, but then also it gives options for what they can be. So to estimate the number of species that are threatened with extinction, you need to know what proportion of species are threatened and how many species there are. And the answers to both of those questions are a little bit more complicated, but bear with me and I'll try and outline it. The IUCN have done a fantastic job over the last 25 years or so of assessing the extinction risk of all the species in an increasing number of taxonomic groups. So to estimate how many species are threatened with extinction, you need to know how many species there are and what fraction of them are threatened. 
There's no absolute certainty on how many species there are, but there's a range of estimates and they seem to be converging somewhere between 5 million and 10 million. So for this assessment, we used a recent estimate published a few years ago that there are 8.1 million species of animals and plants. And we also uh, needed to know, as we'll see later, what fraction of them are insects. And it looks as though about three quarters of species are insects. So that's about five and a half million insect species. The reason we need to know about insects separately is they seem to be a bit of an outlier in terms of what fraction of species are threatened. So the IUCN have been doing brilliant work over 25 years now, assessing all the species in an increasingly wide range of different taxonomic groups, like birds and mammals and amphibians, and reforming corals and cycads. And they've also been assessing representative samples of other groups, like higher plants. So, Although the fraction of species that are threatened with extinction does differ among these groups, down as low as seven, eight, nine percent in bony fish, up to two thirds of cycads, the average across groups is about one in four, 25 percent. So you might think, okay, 25 percent of species are threatened with extinction, but insects haven't been as well covered, basically because they are so diverse that it's not been possible to accumulate enough information on enough of the species. The best evidence we have is that insects may have a rather lower fraction of threatened species, but it's very unlikely to be much below 10%. So we've assessed uh, the overall number of threatened species based on 10% of insects, so that's a bit over half a million insects, and 25% of the animal and plant species that aren't insects. So that's about another half a million. Add them together, you have a million. What we didn't do is make any attempt whatsoever to estimate how many microbial species there might be that are threatened with extinction. And that's because we really don't know how many species of microbe there even are. So it's true that scientists have only formally described and named a little under 2 million species, but 10,000 new species are described each year, and there's no sign that we're going to run out anytime soon. So we know that there are far more than that, even if we don't know quite how many. The estimate we've used in this assessment is that the total number of animal and plant species on Earth is just over 8 million. So it's sensible to include the undescribed, unnamed species in our estimate. And we've assumed that they're as likely to be threatened with extinction as the named species. Now, that's almost certainly a conservative assumption. If we look through the history of when species get described, it's the widely distributed ones that are found across a large chunk of the world that tend to be described first. And then if we look at which species in a taxonomic group are threatened and which ones aren't, then the ones that are threatened are the ones with small geographic distributions. So the unnamed species will tend to have smaller geographic distributions than the named ones. And that will mean, if anything, they're probably more threatened than the averages that we have used. That's not true for two reasons. The first one is that biodiversity now is not higher than it's ever been before, so far as we know. The fossil record makes it look as though there are now more species than ever before, but that is because older rock with fossils from species longer ago is harder to find. There's less of it because it gets recycled in subduction zones, it melts again and all the fossils are gone, or it gets covered up by subsequent deposits. So the rock that's easiest to find is the most recent rock. And also it's easiest to identify species that have close living relatives. 
and that means it's easier to split organisms up to classify them. So it looks as though we have more different kinds of organism in the recent fossil record than we did in the past. But actually, if you do an analysis that considers those biases that I've mentioned, then there's no evidence that diversity has been increasing over the last few hundred million years. And then the second reason that the assertion is wrong is that extinction does matter, irrespective of whether biodiversity has been higher or lower in the past. In the past, human well-being didn't depend on biodiversity, and now it does. So from a selfish perspective, we should be concerned. All of these species play roles in their ecosystems. We don't directly exploit or use all of them. We don't even know about most of them. But if you take them away, an analogy that's often used is it's like taking rivets out of an aeroplane. How many rivets should you take out of an aeroplane before it will fall out of the sky? Do you want to be on the aeroplane while the experiment is done? Because that is what we're doing by wiping species out on the only planet that we can call home. I'm sure that some people deny the biodiversity crisis because it's just so scary. They don't want to think about it. And I can understand that point of view. But there's a second group of people who deny the biodiversity crisis. Effectively, it's people who are paid to deny it the way that people have been paid to deny the realities of climate change and humanity's role in that. We can take action to prevent the biodiversity crisis getting out of hand, to prevent the wave of extinctions that otherwise is coming down the track, to secure our livelihoods, which depend on ecosystems continuing to function. But to do that requires transformative change across countries, governments, businesses, individuals. We have to change how we operate, what we do. And there are vested interests who don't want that to happen. One of my favourite sentences in the whole global assessment goes as follows. By its very nature, transformative change can expect opposition from those with vested interests in the status quo, but such opposition can be overcome for the broader public good. 